Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon and welcome. I'm very, very pleased to moderate and host uh, this panel from uh, Kyushu University. Uh, Kyushu University has been uh, uh, a partner for actually quite a few years now. And I also want to recognize the key convener from Kyushu University, Dr. Toru Oga, uh, who has on numerous occasions attended the on-site conference uh, uh, of Asia Center here in Bangkok. Uh, Asia Center also has uh, cooperated uh, in supporting and occasionally, you know, co-convening uh, activities on uh, Southeast Asia and beyond uh, uh, for students uh, from the region. So very much pleased uh, uh, to be here. Uh, today we have uh, uh, two panelists online. There's uh, the, Dr. Toru, uh, you know, uh, uh, who is on screen and uh, uh, very often a uh, friend, Jocelyn, uh, from, from the University of Philippine, Philippine uh, Diliman, who we also uh, interact uh, quite often uh, in the last two years, mostly online, but Jocelyn, hope to see you soon uh, here as well. And great, and we have uh, Professor Kim Jinhee, who's here, you know, uh, uh, on site, uh, uh, Professor Kim is from the Korean Education Development Institute, uh, and, and myself, James Gomez, one of the directors at HS Center, very pleased to be here. Now, this is how I would like to uh, facilitate the session. I want to first uh, give each panelist a couple of minutes to kind of introduce yourself, uh, you know, your area of work, perhaps, uh, you know, what you do at your institution, just so people can get to know you. And then after that, uh, I will ask each of you to make your initial uh, intervention, uh, uh, either your prepared remarks or slides uh, as you like. And then we can have an interactive uh, discussion after that. So without further ado, I will start with uh, uh, Dr. Toru Ogawa. Uh, who's on screen. Uh, Toru, over to you. Uh, a few minutes of self-introduction and the work that you do so we can get to know you better. Over to you. Okay. Uh, thank you, James. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Toru Oga, and I'm teaching the International Projects International Relations in the Faculty of Law, Kyushu University. University. Um, especially, yeah, I think uh, it is a sad time uh, to prevent Asian Center, and especially the um, in connected to the today's topic, uh, I'm doing the human rights regime uh, in the ASEAN. So, uh, yeah, I'm, yeah, I, uh, I focus on the research uh, on the human rights and the international relations. Especially, I focus on the East Asia and the Southeast Asia. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Toru. I will now go to on site because I have uh, Professor Kim here with me. Uh, Professor Kim, uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about yourself and the work you do. Uh, hello, my name is Jenny Kim. I For two days, I learned a lot, and I think this session will contribute Asia, like a Japan and Korea as a case, and then Philippines as well. My research field is multiculturalism, global citizenship, especially I'm the scholar of education. So maybe I can give some uh, perspective, not just to talk about, you know, policy and role, but how can we, you know, empower people throughout education? That will be long-term uh, vision for us. Thank you. Thank you. We look forward to hearing from you. And Jocelyn, always a pleasure to have you here. Uh, so great. Uh, please introduce yourself. I know you, but the rest of us don't. So over to you, Jocelyn. Yes, good afternoon, and uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, thank you so much, Director Gomez, for inviting me once again, also Professor Oga, to be part of this session. I'm Jocelyn Ocelero. I'm an associate professor at the Asian Center with an N. Uh, it's a graduate school at the University of the Philippines, Diliman. It's the National University, Flag University of the Philippines. Um, I teach a courses on Japan, but I also do a specialization courses on East Asia. And my own specialization is migration studies. So um, for this presentation, I'm going to talk about how the current pandemic um, has also restricted um, the freedom of mobility and and it's all because of the xenophobic um, attitudes, I think, that exists in Japan. So um, looking forward to fruitful discussions with everyone. Thank you very much. 
Fantastic. Now, before I pass the time on to our first speaker, uh, Toru, let me uh, frame uh, you know today's session uh, with a couple of remarks uh, in a few minutes, and uh, I want to point to you a report that Asia Center did last year. Uh, it's simply called Hate Speech in Asia, Southeast Asia. Now, uh, we did that uh, uh, during the first year of the uh, pandemic. This was 2022. So we were looking at what was coming out through the media and, and laws and things like that. And we tried to investigate this notion of uh, hate speech, you know, trying to just, you know, unpack it. We found there were four types of hate, you know, content, thoughts, actions, so on, uh, um, directed at uh, uh, certain communities. Uh, the first type of hate speech was largely, you know, um, directed at religious and ethnic minorities. That's the first one. Sometimes uh, there's intersectionality between uh, religion and ethnicity. So we found that as one cluster. The other one was uh, uh, against women and those uh, were, uh, and sexual minorities, LGBTI groups. Uh, that was another clear uh, theme uh, or, or slither of hate that we could clearly identify. Uh, the third is actually political hate. That means because you have a different set of values, political values, or uh, ideological position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, politics or political participation. Uh, uh, so those who hold that views or, or are involved in activities uh, or, or organizations such as political parties, movements, NGOs, uh, independent media, um, uh, even if you were doing, you know, balance, uh, you know, uh, uh, you, you became a target of hate. Uh, so, so that's the third. The last one was, uh, you know, directed at refugees, uh, migrants, foreigners, and and I just want to then, uh, you know, uh, connect that to the uh, to to the title of the panel: xenophobia and freedom of expression. So here we have freedom of expression, and then we have hate speech, and then we have all these forms of hate that we discovered in our report, and the report is available online. Uh, on our website uh, is one of our most downloaded reports uh, actually in the last two years. So with that framing, Toru, uh, you know, uh, I know you work in this area, so I'll pass the time to you, Toru, uh, uh, for your intervention. Over to you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, excuse me, can I share the screen? Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you, James. So, uh, hello again. My name is Tor Oga, and I'm teaching international relations uh, in the Kyushu University in Japan. So, today uh, I'm going to talk about the health speech and freedom of expression and freedom of speech uh, in Japan. So, in the problem of the health speech, and the politically and legally, the problem is the mostly fixed, the, the, which means that there is the not target of the political debate. and uh, I mean, the most most of the people in the political and and the legal spheres are uh, to agree and the prohibition of the hate speech. But uh, actually, problem is the they are not strongly connected to the people's practice. And I think they are. Uh, I'm going to talk about, but uh, especially the three things. So three things to point out. The first way, um, in the Japanese legal system, the we recognize hate speech. Uh, and we point out the hate speech, but uh, there is actually there is no punishment to the hate speech. This is the first problem. And the second problem is um, it's a problem with the local government and SNS practice. So even if we have a law, but uh, but those kind of norms and those kind of the yeah uh, legal legal practice does not strongly connected with the local government and SNS practice. And finally the those trend uh, is further escalated uh, in the COVID-19. So um, I think the James frame, uh, James framing on the the whole types of the head speech, and maybe uh, my presentation uh, is the focus on the third one and the fourth one. 
uh, and the political hate speech and the hate speech against the foreigners. And maybe uh, it also included the unconscious ways uh, of hate speech and unconscious ways of discrimination. Okay. So uh, content is like this. The first way I'm, I'm going to talk about the discrimination in general against foreigners in Japan. And the second way, uh, I'll explain the how the in the situation of the COVID-19, the those discrimination is expanded. And finally, uh, I have some remarks and there are some comments uh, for the further discussions. Okay, the first way uh, on the overview, um, in the general overview of the discrimination against the foreigners in Japan. So um, actually the Japanese government, the enacted uh, laws that we call hate speech elimination law in 2016. And actually before 2016, that there are the many, many lots of lots of uh, hate speech, um, especially the target of the hate speech is Korean and Chinese in Japan. Uh, because um, in the Japanese uh, migrant communities, the Korean and the Chinese is the majority. So they are easy to be target uh, of those hate speech and uh, xenophobia movements. So uh, in the 2016, the government adopted the hate speech elimination law. But uh, as I said, the yeah, actually government have the many program uh, to eliminate hate speech. But uh, problem is uh, also the government have a law and also local governments uh, have the the similar regulations the against hate speech. But problem is that there's the no sanctions, uh, no punishment. And the, this is a service uh, is a target to the Japanese peoples uh, in the asking the questions. The uh, uh, sorry, the table is in Japanese, but asking the question: uh, the white human rights issues that do you think the mostly happening uh, in against foreigners resident in Japan? So, uh, so they answered the, for example, the difference in customs habits and unacceptability uh, is forty one point three percent. And also unfavorable treatment in employment or working place is a 30%. And also refuse to move into the apartment uh, is a 24%. And the fourth way that, yeah, this is still the discriminatory language and the behavior uh, is uh, over 20%. So uh, over 20% of the Japanese people uh, still think that hate speech is the one of the major problem uh, in the, uh, discrimination against foreigners in Japan. Okay, um, so uh, in in legally, uh, how the hate speech uh, is treated? That this is the decision of the Osaka District Court in the two thousand twenty. So uh, they say the local ordinance that prohibiting hate speech. There is the one way restricting the freedom of expression. But this expression, uh, this restrictions is a reasonably and necessary and unavoidably. And also they explained that those, those regulations is reasonable and justifiable. And also the those measurements to the hate speech is a taken after the expressive activities and don't in, involve the, any sanctions. Therefore, the, those kind of the legal practice the, against hate speech uh, is the justifiable. That this is a decision uh, from the Osaka District Court. Okay, then the how the situation is expressed uh, in the uh, expansion of the COVID nineteen, uh, especially after uh, to uh, after two thousand nineteen. Uh, actually, we have the two set up the discriminations. The first way. Actually, it is maybe unconscious way, right? the discrimination by the government agency, especially for the local government, and second way, the discrimination by the citizens. So the first way, uh, okay, I introduced two cases. The first case is the Itako Public Health Center. So the this public health center, they distributed the document uh, to the, especially for the farmers organizations. And so the purpose of this document is the prevention of the COVID-19 infections. And this document includes the, uh, those, yeah, those, those sentences, the, such as the many new coronavirus cases suspected to have been infected by foreigners 
Oh, uh, uh, so the please don't eat with foreigners or always wear the mask when uh conversing with the foreigners. But actually, the the risk is the same. But uh, this public health center document um irrelevantly focus on the bio foreigner or with foreigners. And after that, they after many criticisms to this public center, the document was later withdrawn. And the second case is uh, in the Saitama city. Uh, the Saitama city is the next to the Tokyo. So uh, in the first place, the Saitama city planned to distribute 240 masks from the employee and working press, daycare center, and kindergarten and the schools, uh, and blah, blah, blah. But um, however, and also in the Saitama city, that there are many Korean kindergartens, but uh, this Saitama series, the Korean kindergarten was excluded from this distributions uh, of the masks because according to the explanations, it was not facilities supervised by the city. Uh, therefore, they explained that they are excluded the, in the Korean kindergarten, the target of the delivering the masks. And after that, the when Korean kindergarten and the Japanese citizens they protested against the yeah this is the discrimination. The Saitama city announced the it would distribute masks to the Korean garden as well. So in the two cases, so especially um in the local government, the sometimes the the discrimination against foreigners uh, is a take price. The even uh in unconscious way, and but if the government they're doing. The, this kind of things. They also are uh, in the civil society and also in the SNS. Uh, there's there's some discussion, and but in the negative ways, there's some hate speech is take place the against foreigners. Uh, also in the corner measures uh, in Japan and uh, actually in the Japanese government, uh, the nowadays it is a different, but. Uh, in the past, uh, especially in the nine, uh, 2020 and 2021, uh, they have very strict restrictions the entering the foreigner, and especially the no distinction between the residents and the tourists. And also, the so uh, from 2022 onwards, the Japanese government has been gradually easing the entry restrictions and, and the foreigners. Uh, also, in the civil society practice, the, we have the yeah, we can identify the kind of the fake science the such as um yeah actually it is it is very stupid but but those kind of fake science is spread in even the media and even the social network the it is the such as the english people voice more than japanese people so infection spread more easily or the foreigners are more infectious because the they spit the more they speak more uh, when they speak or something like that. So these fakes are spreading on the social network site. And the different uh, each SNS sets the own standard uh, and the regulations uh, of the, those fake news and those the hate speech. But however, in the few cases, the post uh, those posts are actually uh, are actually not deleted. So uh, finally, um, I have some concluding remarks. So firstly, and the discriminatory and inappropriate language, the actions or policies are uh, toward the foreigner by the government agency, the, especially the local government. And the second way, so that, um, there are some limitations of the hate speech regulations in Japan uh, because there are no penalty and the only the recognition. And thirdly, so, uh, so actually we have the limitation of self-regulation of SNS and actually the, those uh, inappropriate posts is not always uh, deleted. And finally, so there are political and judicial, judicial conclusions. Hate speech cannot be justified by the freedom of expression. However, it is not necessarily linked to the local government and citizens' practice, uh, such as SNL. So I, I think the yeah, I gonna I gonna discuss those kind of topic further uh, in the discussion and question and answer time. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Toro. Yeah, that's that. Uh, that was scary. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Toro, but but um, this this session is interactive, so I'll be coming to you personally to ask your experience as well. But before I do that, uh, Toro, just one question uh, to you. Uh, yeah. You mentioned the easing of travels uh, for foreigners to enter Japan. 
is that a sign that, that this is a, an easing of anti-foreigner sentiment or the sentiment is still there? Yeah, you are complete, completing right. So if the many foreigners, they're coming to Japan more easily, so more easily, you know, the, there is statement of the kind of a hate speech against foreigners. Oh, so you see it's increasing then because of yeah, yeah. more people. Now, I want to just make it a live uh, uh, interaction before I, I come to Professor Kim. Nalin Rad. Now, Nalin Rad, you know Nalin Rad, but I think maybe what you don't know about Nalin Rad was Nalin Rad is a graduate of Ritamaken University. She spent four years there. She, she worked nearly two years. So, Nalin Rad, what was your experience as a foreigner living that many years in Japan? I was actually about to ask some questions to uh, Professor Toru. So basically, uh, just to share my experience when I was in Japan. So I spent uh, four years studying, like doing my bachelor there, and I spent a year working in Tokyo. And my experience over there was quite uh difference because i basically i stay in different city when i was studying i spend my times in a small city called, called beppo so basically it's like in the southern part of japan is a tourist cities you know with onsen hot spring and stuff and over there the population was basically like the elderly like uh old japanese peoples and and i was in an international uh university so basically we we were like in in Japanese we have the word called gaijins which basically like it's a shortened form from uh gaikokujin which mean foreigners but we shorten it so sometimes can I'm not sure whether I can interpret it directly but sometimes it sounds like an outsider like like the meaning of it so we are basically gaijins for to the those local peoples and. Even those those local people, Italy's and you know, like the local Japanese there, they many of them are familiar to see like foreigners, you know, in the town, like walking around. I think we still somehow facing some sort of xenophobia, I would say, like they are afraid to talk to us. They are quite they avoid talk, like they tend to avoid talking to us, even those we can speak Japanese. So basically, even my friends approach them, asking them like some simple questions about directions in Japanese. They still refuse to answer, and they just simply say, "I'm not speaking English. I can't speak English." Even though we speak to them in in Japanese, and and I believe my friends also speak perfectly Japanese. So that's what that's the things that we we discovered when we were there. Yeah, but I have another question, so I think I will until Q and A time. So this thing was a crazy name. Yeah, I know. I, 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 my wife is Japanese, married for 22 years. So one of the statistics that was very, very interesting was the, um, the, the marriage statistics you had. You know, it says uh, uh, 14 point something percent uh, 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 disagreeable. I don't know. I think sometimes my wife disagrees with me more. <laughs> uh, I think it's about 35 percent. You know. So, but anyway, uh, yeah, I lived in Japan. I'm a Japanese um, uh, resident. Uh, permanent resident and, and I can relate to what uh, Nalirant has said and and so on but let's go to you uh, Kim uh, uh, over to you uh, uh, what are your thoughts and observations on this topic well <laughs> it's really interesting English people the spreading out this, <laughs> you know the Toroga the, the presentation it was really interesting but my experience I'm actually a resident staying in Kyushu, we were invited by uh, Professor Oga, and as a foreign uh, professor, foreign academic, staying in in COVID nineteen situation, and the problem is I don't speak Japanese, right? I'm I'm Korean, Kankokujin, and but you know I have a communication problem with the Japanese people. It's like you, you said uh, when I said that uh, I only speak in in English in supermarket and. You know, a lot of young people, even young people, they learned over 10 years English, but 
I ask it, uh, has you much it? Or excuse me, is this right? Something when I approach them, they will threaten. Oh, oh I don't speak in, like English, something like that. Even young people. But compared to Korea, South Korea is really open and in terms of progressive, you know, working with the foreign people. So my experience, I'm, you know, I live in very safety situation in Kyushu University and residence, but outside of, uh, you know, residence, I feel like, uh, of course, isolated because I cannot speak Japanese. That is one of the issue, but... Well, things going on, I hope, because the Japanese government now, they don't ask a PCR test from September 7th. That is one of the symbolized, you know, uh, you know, symbolic situation. They try to open the door for foreigner after COVID-19, maybe. So I hope, uh, you know, the situation will be progressing. Yeah. Uh, um, could you provide us some insights uh, uh, about Korea? Uh -huh. yeah you know uh, is it similar like japan is it different um uh, only if you can you know uh, uh, i mean you you come from the education uh, yes, sector yes. maybe you could give us an insight you know how 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 it's like you know um uh, from anything that you know observe or study uh, is it yeah. related with the, with the total organs presentation uh, no, no no just uh, yours yours yeah oh mine oh, can you open my slide yeah so i i'm quite you know curious to see you know yeah today yeah. my topic is uh, uh related with the xenophobia and migrant worker refugees in South Korea. My slide is uh, over 20 something, but I tried to make it short. Uh, can you share with my slide? First of all, well, in Korea become multicultural society over 10 years back. We have a multicultural policy. So our the put in residency is over 5%. So United Nations defined that one society is a uh, you know, foreign residents. Uh, excuse me, excuse me. Uh, I'm very sorry. Uh, could you share the Dr. Kim's screen? Yeah, in person. Dr. Kim's slide. Yeah, yeah, first uh, okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Today I'm going to talk about democracy and um, the diversity issue, and yeah, especially focus on global citizenship education. Well, my personal experience, I travel over 70 countries as a United Nations or a UNESCO advisor. I'm also evaluator for, you know, quick as a program manager, but I'm academic. But, you know, so when I engage with the United Nations, I also travel a lot of different African country in Asia, ASEAN country. So as a, you know, education, you know, people, I recognize the world they really engage with the disparity and inequality. Today, we talk about a lot of issue about, you know, freedom of speech in Cambodia and in Indonesia and gender issue. A lot of things is related with the democracy and inequality issue. So I think as an education scholar, the more empowered, when you are more educated, when you are more informed, we can create very uh, more solid and transparent and a very strong civil society. That is my argument. And let me ask a question. You know, oh, uh, it's too soon. Can you go back? Okay. Oh, this one. The sink. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, computer, right. Because, example, yeah. You know, how many Asian countries are member of the United Nations? And when I give a lecture about, when I teach about that issue for my student, like they are 25 or sometimes I give a lecture for headmaster over 50 years old, but they don't know about how many countries in United Nations, even Asia Pacific. The answer is United Nations in, in whole general is 193, but Asia Pacific, we can call it over 46 countries, one of the UNESCO member country. So that means it's really diverse, a very different society. So let me ask you another question. What is your country's position in international community? Maybe, do you consider your society, your country is an inclusive society? Maybe if I go back to that question to my country in Korea, 
we have a very strong and very devastated, very complicated uh, democratic movement. Now I can say that we are inclusive society, but we have a lot of problem and Muslim population is increasing. Some countries, some local people, they don't like refugee. We are banning, uh, we are spreading fake news, something like that. We also have uh, some problem. And uh, we know that uh, the democratic, uh, democratic. This is a democratic. The the indicator, which countries you know can be called the democracy. Blah blah blah. Because for two days conference, I think you know we all talk about the democratic or human rights related thing. And your country has a pluralistic system. It's not just about you know former. Maybe we do need a. Oh, at least, you know, like a coexistence of two regulation. And second, do you have a free or fair election process? That is important. And the government that operates openly and transparently, that is really important. And the politically engaged with the citizen, I should underline that one. Right. In Korea, we have a big supporting group for Myanmar situation now, and even educator, we donate a lot of money. We support, you know, the state's month for against the coup, against the military government. So, so we try to support the democratic principle, not just for for Korean people because we are global citizens. We want to support for uh, Cambodia and uh, you know uh, Myanmar, and uh, something is not really uh, fair or democratic society. And then uh, democracy indicator also so that, you know, is preserving civil uh, liberty and uh, personal freedom that is really in the important. Of course, the five uh, indicators, independent media, that is really important issue. And so this is the indicator. So I think we can talk today, I'm going to talk about a lot of issue, but let me share about the case of Korea. So in case of Korea, we are not, we are not naturally democratic society. We had a lot of you know, issue about the you know, June uh, big transformation, but like uh, five years ago, nearly five years ago, we had a candlelight revolution. You might heard about that Korean president impeachment. She was a, she was a daughter of a, like, a, dictator, we can call it Park Jong-hee. So my generation, we can call him dictator, but she, uh, she earned a lot of legacy. But one of the problem is the president, ex-president Park Geun-hye, she abused a lot of a bribery issue. He was her, she was found guilty of abuse of power and corruption and sentenced to 24 years. Myself, even I'm a doctor, I'm a professor. I came to the Gwanghamun in Seoul with my friends group, with my, 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 my student. We stand our, spend our money and we went to the, every weekend, every weekend, we go to the, you know, the, the, the Gwanghamun that shows that among OECD country, I think Korea is one of the only impeachment history that nowadays, the current society, right? So among OECD country, I don't think, you know, other in the case of Korea, other case of country can impeach the president. That was a very new, uh, very recent issue. And after that, I want to talk about multicultural policy in Korea. Because of multicultural, you know, policy, we invite a lot of foreigner, foreign migrant worker, and then especially marriage migrant worker from Cambodia. We have a Vietnam wife and we have a lot of Thai, Thai uh, ladies who, uh, who get married with a Korean, uh, we can say they're very old men and they live in rural area. That was a policy. The problem is, you know, we have a, like a back rash after multicultural family. Mm -hmm. So we have a, like a discriminatory word. Oh, they are multicultural family. We can call it damuna. Oh, damuna, that means like looking down from the, you know, the people, especially teacher group, right? So it's uh, it's some some of the situation is worrying, but Korea tried to build up a new generation with a fairer uh, awareness for multiculturalism. 
And then refugee also, that was important. And I think in Korea is the South Korea is the first country in Asia refugee act effect in 2013. So South Korea joined a convention relating with the status of refugee in, uh, a few 10 years ago. And that's why we had a very huge striking of a Yemeni population, Yemen refugee came over to Jeju Island. So the, the government law and the policy is established, but people are not ready to accept refugee. What is that? People doesn't know about their refugee issue. And then because of that issue, some people is demonstrating, we don't like uh, refugee, please go away. There are pro and cons. Some people said uh, fundamental human rights is important. We welcome refugee. We welcome multicultural background people. But the other cons is very strong. They are crazy about their raising their voice. They said uh, high concern of a poor, you know, potential terrorism. They could be terrorists, especially many Korean people worry about Muslim background. Oh, they are Muslim. They might uh, discriminate the woman. They rape the woman, something like that. The fake news is undergoing on the media. That was really funny. So, and citizen, the, the big argument is the safety is first, like a Japanese situation, right? Japanese also talk about safety. Now our Japanese safety is first. So in Korea also says that Korea's safety is a priority. That was a big argument. But after that, what was their answer? What was the situation is going on? After that, we invite another Afghanistan refugee nowadays, over 500 people. So I think in local government and then the Korean central government try to respond because Korea is try to be inclusive society, not exclusive society, how we respond. So my argument and my answer is, that's why we should talk about education. Because you know, choosing a type of education means choosing a type of society. Yesterday, a, a lot of speaker talk about you know informed citizen and you know there are a good level of uh, human human rights something like that. But let me ask you, their curriculum, your curriculum, and in Thailand as well, uh, two thousand twenty in Thailand, you have a, like a big revolution October, right? So I was it was surprising. Young people talk about their curriculum. So because Thailand curriculum and maybe Cambodia and, and Myanmar curriculum consider the learner should be obedient. But if you look at Korean government curriculum, we are critical democratic citizens. That's our goal. So even I'm a teacher, even I'm a professor, I got evaluated by my student. They are entitled to evaluate me. It's not about the authority. That's more fair and democratic situation. So education is not only about human development, this, that should be about you know, nurturing citizenship in lifelong process. It's not about, you know, we are ending their schooling curriculum. We should learn from their uh, lifelong learning process. That was uh, my, it's, it's also my part of a lecture for UNESCO. That is really important thing. So finally, I'm gonna talk about the global citizenship issue and civic education is important. When you recall the SDG, SDG five big philosophic, you know, direction is, it's for people, it's for planet. It's for prosperity. It's for peace and partnership. That's why government and civil society and cooperation, our partnership is important and prosperity. Working together, living together is important. And then uh, the global citizenship is also underlined that and SDG goal. So ensure inclusive, equitable quality of education and promote a lifelong learning opportunity for all. So in Japan, as I know, ESD, Education for Sustainable Development has been underlined. In Korea, global citizenship education is highly underlined after uh, SDG proclaimed in the society. And then the global citizenship is not about the 
because I'm Korean, I only work for Korean. It's not like that. We fight for uh, another citizen. It's not about the blood issue. It's not about skin color. It's not about the class issue. So global citizenship is more about the world mindness and cosmopolitan and grassroots. And that's why we support the Myanmar students, Myanmar young people, and Cambodia young people who suffered from, you know, uh, who suffer from, you know, their, the, they, somebody is live in the fear. So we try to support and build up a civil society through that. And yeah, there, you know, in the human being, I knew a lot of human being try to put our state to cover. But if you consider civic participation, global citizenship, that case showed that in Germany and France, they, they said no border, no nation, we need, we can uh, impact, if we can embrace their refugee. So it's kind of a civic uh, education, civic movement that is important. No more detention, something like that. So in Korea, we don't, we educate people, not just educated people, if you are normal citizen, Korean people argue that we cannot deport somebody who are suffered from, you know, Afghanistan, they, uh, they flee from the country, we cannot go back, you know, you cannot return that people because they might be you know, banished, they might be uh, punished a lot. So, so Korea tried to build up uh, like a global citizenship issue. And then, yeah, that's one of the Korean teenagers petition to Blue House. We want to uh, invite, don't deport our, uh, our classmate. So the classmate background is uh, he's uh, he's from the refugee, the yellow yellow color, the boy. He, her his age is fifteen, but her father and him only two person uh, illegally immigrated to the Korean government. They lived seven years. They are deported. They are supposed to be deported, but teenager made a big you know argument. Uh, please you know like uh, help uh, my 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 friends so do not deport them. So it's about you know teenage petition that was was really democratic I think that that's really a good turning point, and this is one of the action for climate change for teenager. They gather together in Gangnamun. They try to build up you know uh, is we we want to do something for climate change. It's more about the SDG. So people's movement action together that is very important because. We don't regulate it by role or system and policy. The more important thing is, you know, grassroots people's mindset working together. We try to move forward together. That's important. And then this is a, one of the case for how Myanmar, you know, how Korean uh, teacher group support the Burmese, uh, Burmese, Burmese uh, their student. Oh, I think. Can you move to the Myanmar situation? Because uh, the slide is just gone. <laughs> That's uh, initially the more maybe later part in Myanmar. It's after teenager climate change. Mm -hmm. So let me share about the Myanmar the support group. So we, uh, Korean teacher group, they are former teacher group. They are, we have a 500 teacher group. They work together. They using the cacao line. And we consider that this is a big problem, problematic situation. Why don't we not just to make a statement? Why don't we donate money to support the Miami people? And then we try to change our curriculum because that shows that even though we are Korean people, we try to we are we are a member of the ASEAN country. So we support the Korean, uh, Cambodian, and Myanmar students who uh, love under the under the threat. So Korean people, Korean teacher, try to change our curriculum to you know act together. That shows you know global citizenship issue is undergoing in in Korea. So I think it's, I can move the final slide. Can you do that? Yeah, that will be 
Yes, that was a you know, statement that you know we worked together on wellness, and after that we collected our statesmen and civic protest movement together. You know, they were standing together in winter time. It was freezing, but it's not just once. Every weekend, every weekend, still we are acting together. So that is very important issue. So. So that shows a global community for solidarity. We work together. So finally, I can say that. So what is universal model among democratic country? If your country defines to be democratic country, first priority, the most important thing is human dignity. We are individual human beings. So our human dignity should be appreciated by role, by, you know, by speech, by treatment, by civic you know, awareness, engagement, that is important. So education scholar, I do underline active citizenship, that is really important. We are not educating people to be obedient. You should follow the teacher, or you should obey doctor, it's not like that. So informed, the critical, democratic, supporting to the people is the important thing. Yeah, this is my final reflection. So vision of Asia in post-COVID-19, uh, embracing inclusion and sustainability in systematic, systematic way is important. So that systemic way is, is, is about we have to combat you know, exclusion and discrimination. And then global citizenship is learning live together. That is also important. Finally, Civic education and citizen education can be a driving force, a build a, a participatory democracy and then social capital. And finally, number four is empowering underprivileged group individuals through education and redesigning social landscape is important. Let me share my story. I studied, I earned my PhD in, in England. I saw the many refugee background people. And when I studied in Canada as a, as a master's student, in Canada and England, the both classroom it was interesting. That classroom tried try to support uh, a lot of fund, the scholarship for indigenous background people. So the government, Canadian government especially, they believe indigenous people is not giving the money. You can be the intellectual for your society. That means they invest a lot of money and then they can say something, not from the doctor's story. They can do something. So education is big power. So underprivileged people is not living like this. They should be more empowered through education. Otherwise, you know, splendid, beautiful law or a policy cannot save us. That's my argument. We do work together. We have to, you know, collect our statesmen, work together and move together, educate together. That is important. Thank you. This was my presentation. Thank you very much for that very uh, rich and deep uh, observations. Uh, I have one question, three parts, and, and uh, this is drawn from Toru's table. Um, so I, I remember three things, and maybe you can just give us an impression from Korea. What is the level, and of course, this is arbitrary, not scientific, for um, the ability for foreigners, you know, uh, to be able to rent a accommodation uh, without prejudice, you know? so, uh, so one on accommodation. Uh, the other one is, uh, let's say, employment. Uh, working, working, uh, you know, and, and third is, you know, marriage or partnership. I think this was some of the several that he had. Could you just give us an indication how Korean society is when, you know, foreigners, you know, engage maybe in this randomly picked uh, variables? Yes. Uh, in Korea, I calculated that oh, our foreign residents, uh, their, their home country backgrounds is over 100, 107 countries which is super diversity, right? They're from Africa, they're from East Asia, blah, blah, blah. Different kind of people is working together. Without migrant worker, our society GDP can collapse. That's my argument. Uh, the problem is that the working condition from Southeast Asia, their migrant workers' situation is not really good because some people 
uh, treat them badly in especially rural area. They don't uh, pay enough money for them. So for example, without them, the rural farming situation is collapsing. And number two, second point is migrant, marriage migrant worker situation. Oh, no, no, marriage migrants. Mary's migrant situation is uh, highly improved, I believe, because Ministry of Gender, Ministry level, so we support them. They, we consider they are citizens of their Korea now. So we try to provide a lot of fund you know, adjusting, but against like a foreign labor, because we consider foreign labor is a guest who can left after five years or something like that. So, and then, uh, the third angle is we have our asylum seeker and refugee. That is, uh, you know, that situation is not really good. You know, it, it, we have a very precarious situation for, you know, who who try to find uh, some space in Korea. It's not good. But the marriage migration, that proportion is okay. The migrant workers' proportion is uh, the situation will be increasing, but not really good. So that's. That's why you know many people, school curriculum and the C CSO and non-profit organization also try to support that you know foreigner, but can call it foreigner group, foreign migrant worker group, and can be empowered through the civil society. Okay, great. Now here, here, here's a fun fact uh, for me. You know, you're sharing your personal story, and uh, I'm from Singapore, and uh, I have a Singaporean newsman there, so it might be. Uh, uh, interesting for him. So uh, when I was an undergraduate in the National University of Singapore, uh, we had a system where you need to, to be good enough to be selected to do your honours year degree uh, uh, four years. And, you know, I had a choice uh, of a double honours, either in philosophy or uh, political science. I chose political science. At that time, uh, in the early 90s, it was the Asian values debate. So I studied the curriculum. Uh, or primary and secondary schools where they were teaching Asian values. And my findings showed broadly, they were teaching the children to be obedient, right? So, so when I submitted the thesis with the finding, my American professor who was my you know, supervisor, gave me a first class. The Singaporean professor whose book on Asian values I critiqued that's part, part of my uh, thesis failed me. <laughs> You know, and I'm a consistent student, yeah. Uh, so my, my, my thesis had to go out of the country to Australia uh, for independent adjudication. Yeah, so, so, uh, so uh, this is just to reinforce your you know, uh, observation as an educationalist that it's such a powerful tool. Uh, and, and in Singapore, they teach obedience and being risk aversive, uh, which is very different uh, from, uh, yeah, yeah. Tell you, you can tweet that. <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, that's a little bit of tidbit. Uh, Jocelyn, just priming it up for you. Uh, how, how are you doing? Tell us how you're doing after the elections. Are you properly rested now? Uh, it was hectic, I, I imagine, until some weeks ago in the Philippines. Right. Um, yeah. Actually, right now I'm in Tokyo. <laughs> oh, you're in Tokyo, ago. yeah. Yes, yeah, wow. a few weeks ago I met up with uh, Professor Oga because uh, we were planning a few things. Um, so I'm here. And this is I consider this a break and escape from all escape. the craziness. I like that. <laughs> from all the craziness right now happening in the uh, back home because uh, yeah, we just have, we just have a new president, new government. Everything is in transition. So I, in fact, uh, one of the challenges of doing uh, field work, uh, I've been doing interviews that include interviewing some of the members of the Philippine Embassy, and I can't do that because they're in transition right now, so I don't know who will be the new ambassador and who will be the new uh, members of the, the, the embassy right now, so this is one of the challenges, so even though I'm taking a break, it does I can't escape from the fact that you know the government is is uh, has to deal with a lot of you know changes right now and and all of us researchers i think are on hold in terms of doing um yeah research activities too bad <laughs> yeah it's, uh, yeah thank you for the update uh, yeah yeah well uh, enjoy your escape but but <laughs> now over to you we, we want to hear, hear, hear from you and your presentation right so i'd like to uh share my screen if you could allow me Okay. 
Okay. Okay. Oops. It's not doing. Okay. So I hope you can see it now. Can you see it now? Okay. Is it visible? Yes. All right. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Gomez and also uh, Professor Oga for this opportunity to once again uh, join the Asia Center Conference. This is my second time, as mentioned by Director James, uh, the, the introduction part. Um, and uh, to contribute to uh, the panel session, I uh, decided to uh, share a piece of my ongoing fieldwork right now in Tokyo. I'm doing research on the impact of the pandemic on immigrant lives. Lives. And um, um, I think uh, hopefully that this is, however, in preliminary stage, hopefully I'll be able to write a decent paper out of this. But also it was to give me an opportunity to have a conversation with everyone uh, joining this conference, especially those really interested in issues of xenophobia, you know, anti-immigrant sentiment. Um, so to start off, I'd like to say that the current COVID-19 pandemic is not only a global crisis of health and economic recession, but also a crisis of legality. Um, for many migrants who were forced to stay uh, in host countries due to border control, but at the same time, they were kept out of the legal system due to denied access to visa in order to uh, reside and live formally in host countries. So asylum seekers are political migrants uh, who, like other human beings, have the right to move and live in a peaceful and orderly society. If their homeland cannot guarantee their rights, they should be able to seek refuge and find a place um, where those rights are realizable. Migration distributes justice to those who, denied it, who are denied of it in the place uh, of birth. Um, but when pandemic hit the world, um, people's mobility was restricted to prevent the spread of the virus, but such absence of movement has also suspended justice to so many people due to prevailing xenophobia and ambiguities in immigration policies, especially towards asylum seekers and refugees, people who I call political migrants. Um, in the case of Japan, the prevalence of stringent immigration rules can be partly explained by the anti-immigrant sentiment of Japanese immigration officials toward political migrants or those asylum seekers denied of refugee status amidst the current pandemic. So allow me to use this uh, presentation to have a conversation with you about human rights and well-being in the midst of pandemic. So uh, I have uh, five parts here. So I'm going to just revisit some of the key concepts. I think that we've been going back and forth as far as Professor Oga and Professor Kim's presentations are concerned. Uh, I'll say a few things about xenophobia, although Professor Oga already touched upon this, I think uh, focusing on hate speech uh, culture in, in Japan. I'll give an overview statistics wise of refugee situation before and during the pandemic. And I'll zero in on the case of Mario, the one I interviewed uh, last week, who is a political migrant. And uh, I has just highlight a few points for discussion and conclusion. So just to review some concepts, no, I'd like to clarify here and using some of the scholarly work and also some uh, United Nations reports, no, um, scholarly work, especially by Japanese scholars, no, have pointed to the definition of xenophobia as an attitudinal orientation of hostility against non-narrative and uh, non-natives in a given population um, and uh, some of the basis for such xenophobic um, tendencies can be what well, one's nationality sorry social or economic positions um, and all of these factors contribute to the formation of perceptions of threat no or the lack of security no or a threat to uh, a country's uh, security so um um, as far as Japan's Immigration Control and Refugee Recognition Act, or ICRA, um, and also inconsistent with um, uh, inconsistency with United Nations definitions, no, I refer to the definition of asylum seeker here as uh, somebody who is seeking international protection. No, in countries with individualized procedures, an asylum seeker is someone whose claim has not yet been finally decided on by the country in which he or she submitted it. 
Um, so asylum seeker is different from a refugee. Uh, as per 1951 Refugee Convention, a refugee is someone who is unable or unwilling to return to their country of origin because of well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion. In the context of Japan, no, of ICRA, uh, asylum seeker is ultimately recognized. Not all asylum seekers are ultimately recognized as refugees. Meaning, even if you, because there's no asylum seek, uh, asylum right or provision offered by the Japanese uh, policy, um, even if you try to, uh, you know, stay in Japan legally, the only way you could do that as an asylum seeker is not as an asylum seeker per se, but to, to become a refugee. So. Uh, refugee status, uh, so anybody who is a refugee usually starts as an asylum seeker in Japan. So meaning there's no uh, like distinction. Uh, I mean, there's no right to asylum, but an asylum seeking right to stay in Japan can become can can seek permission to stay as a refugee you know in the context of Japan. So these I ask questions no? how do political asylum seekers, influence anti-migrant sentiment in Japan. No? Knowing that Japan already has some um, distinctive you know, attitudes no, towards uh, um, migrants being you know, a minority no, in the society. And secondly, how do Japanese immigrant officers frame political asylum seekers, especially that the Immigration Bureau is responsible for granting refugee status no, to them? Um, so when migration is at times viewed as a security issue in a lot of conservative nations no, around the world, not just Japan, no? and because this is seen as a security concern, any spike or sudden rise in the number of migrants no, um, can, be, can suggest no, uh, sort of a threat no, uh, that migrants can jeopardize security and order. So there is... Uh, an escalation of fear uh, that the public, you know, the native population might not become safe, no? And this is according to a study done by uh, Nagayoshi and her team. Um, in Japan, also, there's pervasiveness of stereotypes, no? Negative descriptions, uh, characterizations uh, against migrants, no? Migrants as sources of crimes, no? Uh, and the basis for the increasing rates of uh, crime or other other social uh, issues or problems, they're also a welfare burden. So that when you increase the number of migrants, most likely the welfare state budget might be drained. So there have been some uh, reports or, or uh, discussions, no debates on this, even in other contexts. No, um, so. So the tendency is that Japan being so conservative, even though there's been a recent rise in the number of migrant laborers coming in from Southeast Asia, you now Japan has kept the migrant population to 1.6% uh, no, of the total population, which is the lowest among OECD countries. No? And, and that is a very conservative number and that exacerbates also these uh, uh, existing stereotypes that I've mentioned. Along with that, there's also rigid immigration policies that have led to a consistently low um, acceptance rate of refugees no? and low refugee population in Japan. It's the lowest globally. Japan only accepts about 0.4% uh, of the total number of refugees around the world. Um, and... Uh, there's another study conducted by Gong and Wang no, comparing different migrant groups no, in Japan. And they wanted to know whether the, the negative contact, prior negative contact no, of native you know, Japanese people uh, with migrants can actually exacerbate you know, xenophobia. And that sort of finding came out in their study, um, which leads us to the thinking that this, there's... there's uh, 
Tokyo Immigration Bureau, the one responsible, no, authorized to determine who are migrants who can safely stay in Japan, can possibly be influenced by pre previous negative ethnocultural encounters, no. For example, the Filipinos are the fourth largest migrant population in Japan, no, and uh, unfortunately, J uh, Filipinos are identified predominantly in low-skilled jobs. And in the 1980s and 90s, when Filipino migrants came in hundred thousands, a lot of them became undocumented and overstayed. And I think that that context no, of minority within minority, I think I, I'm going to explain that even further later, that that sort of um, uh, you know, negative uh, context of reception among Filipinos have a negative spillover as well, even to Filipinos applying for refugee status. Um, during the pandemic, 7,351 uh, 7, uh, 59 applications for refugee status were processed um, in Japan. So that's combined 2020 and 2021, you can see. But of this number, only 124 were granted. Um, sorry, only 114, 111, sorry, 111 um, uh, were granted recognition, no, were granted approval, which really, um, you know, suggests that very consistently low, no, the only time that Japan's spike in number of refugee applications was in 2017, that's close to 20,000, but even that, only less than 50 were granted refugee recognition by the government. So Japan has been very conservative, I think, when it comes to accepting um, refugees um, into its borders. So, um, so as I've mentioned, no, as I as mentioned, no, asylum seekers suffers from a crisis of legality um, during the pandemic. No, asylum seekers with pending legal resident issues, no, for, uh, applications with the Immigration Bureau, uh, all of these applications were delayed in terms of processing, and so they were like in a way. <laughs> stateless during the pandemic. They're unable to gain legal status, no, and they were forced to remain in Japan um, undocumented. Unable to return to home country as well for indefinite indefinite period because Japan doesn't really uh, set a particular you know time period for for uh, how long they can stay then they have to stay until the results uh, the decision comes out and when the decision comes out they have to wait for six months to appeal in order to extend that uh, uh, process so Japan tends to treat immigrants as visitors as sojourners but at the same time because there's this mechanism where they can apply for refugee status you can also say that they don't outright exclude them no um at the same time japan has this very segmented policy in uh in in its labor migration uh, uh labor and accepting and managing labor migration in a way that japan keeps on you know being assertive to ac accept a lot of highly skilled professionals no but they're very uh, stringent when it comes to unskilled and low skilled no uh, and so there are side and back channels existing uh, through which these low skilled and unskilled uh, people are able to go through um, so what are the reasons no why refugees asylum seekers uh, have become invisible minority within minority no um, so if ordinary people uh, struggle from political uh, and social invisibility twice can be said no about asylum seekers and refugees and the reasons for that uh, is one asylum seekers and refugees are categorized as migrants to be controlled rather than protection rather than you know being given protection there's no provision for that no and they are not the ones to be rescued by the state even though japan in the global community has been one of the most generous in terms of donating money to uh refugee uh protection and, and rescue no in elsewhere no outside of japan number two there's a lack of transparency in decision making process because in the international uh the immigrant immigration control and refugee recognition act of 2004 um it doesn't state clearly what are the requirements no as 
that would lead for approval for refugee status. So there's a lot of ambiguity in the decision-making process being done by the Immigration Bureau. And number three, the rarity of refugee situation in Japan, no? which reminds me of Professor Kim's presentation um, prior to mine, uh, where if you have the global citizenship education, I think people will become sensitive, will be sensitized to the, 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 the struggles no? in the lives of refugees around the world. And so Japan really is a very, various, uh, very serious issue of uh, lack of public awareness and knowledge about who refugees are. Um, so Filipino uh, political refugees constitute a very small number of, in fact, the, the Philippine embassy doesn't have figures no, on how many Filipinos actually seek um, asylum and refugee status recognition in Japan. No? Um, and and um, in my uh, past interviews with a lot of Filipinos, even the undocumented ones or those seeking refugee status, uh, many of them have been here because they were politically persecuted. No, They are political activists. I'm going to come back to that later. Um, so they're excluded, and they're absent in statistical reports. No, refugees are vaguely defined in Japan. No, and what even complicates this debate? No, about who refugees are. No, how different are they from asylum seekers? You have the sudden, you know, influx of Ukrainians. No, because of the current uh, war right now. No, who are regarded not as refugees but humanitarian evacuees. No, that's another framing by the government that confuses the public even more. The next point is that that's a positive relationship between Japan and the Philippines, especially during the 30 administration, no, that's even regarded no, the year 2016 and 2022. That's the period called golden age of Japan-Philippine bilateral relations. Thus, it's very hard to see, you know, even by the Japanese public, that there are re ongoing political persecution and discrimination against radical leaders no, under the Duterte administration. And this affects no, th those Filipinos undocumented and with political and militant backgrounds that are uh, being subject for deportation to the Philippines. So such is the case of Mario, whom I interviewed last uh, last week. No, He's a political asylum seeker. He's a political migrant here. No, He's caught my attention because he applied for refugee status four times but always rejected in those four uh, occasions that he sought for refugee status. No, He was here, uh, his visa got expired, and so he became undocumented. And according to him, he is here, he, he cannot go back to the Philippines for fear of his life because of the rampant red tagging and killings of political activists. No, um, um, and I would say it's still ongoing, even with the exit of President Duterte. Um, so uh, he narrated, no, he shared with me his experience where he was interviewed in all those four occasions no, of his uh, appeal no, for refugee status. So the immigration officers uh, intimidated him no, fusely, asked him the same questions, but he keep on pressuring him to confess to any crime or violation, exhaust his energy no, that, that you know, he really pleads that he's not guilty of doing or any committing any violations no um but uh, what demoralized demoralized him the most is when he was said uh, he was called that he has no value no uh, to japan and that he's a liar and that he's, it's best for him to return to the philippines and the other sentiment Mario told me that really struck, uh, you know, found, I found really striking was every time he was interviewed, there's a Filipino interpreter beside him, but he always had this feeling that the interpreter is conniving with the, the immigration officers because the translation doesn't seem to be uh, um, adequate. No, it is always seems short and baffling. Um, and, and, um, the last uh, part that he shared knowing the conversation that um, he was his last application was rejected again last May and that he is given six months to make an appeal. Um, uh, thankfully, there's a migrant network no, giving him legal assistance so that he can process all of this to court. Otherwise, migrants like him really have no choice but to go back to the Philippines. So how xenophobic is Japan? No, How, how xenophobic are, are uh, the authorities, no, the immigration authorities, when it comes to treating asylum seekers, such as those with Filipino background? No? Um, they tend to 
look at immigrants as culturally threatening. So they, there's still this hegemony of uh, ethnocultural uh, homogeneity that persists Japan, even into the psyche of a lot of, of, of Japanese and even those in authority. No? Immigrants are seen to be uh, responsible for the rising crime rates. No? Um, they are being blamed no, for the rising incidence of crime um, in the city, especially such as Tokyo. Third, immigrants take away resources away from native Japanese residents, such as jobs. So even if Mario has the skills, education, he's a political activist, his, his, his uh, potential to contribute to Japanese society in, in labor market is not being seen by the immigration officers. No? He is seen as simply undocumented who violated the law and therefore should be deported. No? So the past matters in assessing the impact of immigrant presence on current xenophobia towards uh, so the history, no, the negative context of reception of Filipinos in the 80s and 90s has truly impacted how Filipinos are being treated now in Japan, and even uh, and that translates also into the denial of of a legal a legal or documented status, even those seeking refugee recognition. Um, restrictions toward Filipinos no, have been partly rooted to other cases that perhaps being uh, um, um, dealt with no, by the immigration officers, no, uh, apart from the fact that there's vague categorizations of who a successful refugee applicant really is, no, there's a lack of explanation as well on the part of the Immigration Bureau on what is the cause of rejected application. And also maybe compounding the issue, compounding the issue is the fact that, you know, there have been a lot of overstaying Filipinos that are uh, accused of undermining the laws that have been deported in the past. So our political migrants, this is my last slides, our political migrants, you know, seeking refugee status in Japan, really threatening Japanese security. What we can see, obviously, with the existing laws no, and, and limited, very vague provisions towards refugee recognition is discrimination. According to Antonovsky, discrimination vitiates the power and knowledge of its victims so that they may often be unable to take advantage of the facilities and opportunities which do exist to combat it. So the, the specific case here, as I've uh, discussed, no, is the ambiguities that lie in the refugee recognition process no, in accordance with the Immigration Control and Refugee Recognition Act of 2004 in Article 61, where there's no asylum provision, but there's a right or permit to become a refugee in Japan. But the processes are not clear and how um, undocumented and asylum seekers can actually uh, successfully pass no, the application to become a refugee, a refugee is still to be clarified by the government. Japanese immigration officers frame political migrants as a social threat. Uh, and this has been significantly influenced by the pervasiveness of anti-immigrant attitudes towards immigrants already living in Japan. No? Um, as, as I've seen, as I've uh, shown no, in the loophole of the ICRA 2004, you can see that obviously Japan's approach towards accepting asylum seekers and refugees is still quite passive, causing these people to struggle securing recognition. And it suggests that there's an ongoing lack of a clear pathway towards legal and residential status for political migrants in Japan. So in terms of immigration policy that's human rights based, no, Japan has a long way to go and uh, migrants um, are, uh, have, to be con have to continue to struggle through the presence of migrant movements, migrant networks, migrant support organizations. You know, they have been helping out a lot of migrants to access um, refugee status until the government recognizes that migration is a human right and that migrants are contributors to security and sustainable development in fact i think japan will not overcome this negative image of japan before the international community you no know, being anti refugee and anti uh, uh, you know uh uh, being too selective, I think, of, of migrants to come into its borders. And lastly, international human rights law can really influence immigration policies of Japan. And Japan, I think it it's also has the tendency to be conscious as well with 
how it looks before the international community. So hopefully there'll be pressure coming from international organizations no, for Japan to conform to standard laws, to international human rights laws, and there'll be however minute changes, they should be welcome, I think, with open arms by the government. So that ends my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jocelyn. So we had three very interesting uh, presentations. One round of applause for uh, Jocelyn. Uh, three presentations. We had Toru give us a, a top level, you know, um, analysis of the hate speech law without punishment. And then uh, just the range of prejudices uh, within uh, Japan. So, so, so it's a big picture there. Uh, then we, we flipped over to, to Kim. Who, who gave us a view of uh, uh, how uh, the ethos of inclusiveness was being uh, you know, practiced actually by the ordinary people uh, uh, in trying to sort of support you know, uh, refugees, migrants, et cetera. And then we had that very clear case study uh, on, on challenges of the uh, 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 political migrants uh, from uh, the Philippines. Um, uh, as always, we are running out of time, but I just want to like, quickly, you know, uh, collect some questions if you had or reactions. Yeah, uh, Jason. Yeah, uh, I'm just going to collect, you know, uh, whatever remarks you have, and then I'll just give this, uh, one minute. Here from okay, assess by the name of Long Diversity University. Yeah, just two questions, one for Toru and one for Kim. Uh, the first one for Toru, I'm curious to know what our current approaches to address discrimination. And since you mentioned it's not only just hate speech, but also issues of just general government action, as well as perhaps rent discrimination, uh, have there been any forms of uh, approaches for legal reform? Or in any case, maybe perhaps even litigation uh, where you know you sue the government in case there is some basis or is there no basis at the present. So what are current approaches in Japan? Uh, my question for Kim uh, is that we work a lot as well with diversity ed. And I'm curious to know uh, what is the evidence surrounding global citizenship ed specifically for prejudice reduction? And since there is a wide range of social psychological research for prejudice reduction, uh, for example, intergroup contact, exposure to media and so on and so forth, I'm curious to know how does GCE compare and match up to that via the, say, other methods of prejudice reduction that are kind of well studied. Yeah, thank you. Um, anyone else? Yes. Okay. Just a questions to Professor Toru and perhaps Jocelyn, you may also uh, answer these questions. So I just wonder, uh, in terms of like the hate space that's going on on the social media platforms and and you know like uh, sort of some uh, violence comments that that you may found like on Twitter's like made by Japanese. Uh, do you think this? you know, like perspective of anti-foreigners that was reflected through, you know, like the hate speech on the online platforms, very dependent on age of people, like of Japanese and also like geographical areas. Like for example, like I believe in some cities, like Japanese there may have more exposures to foreigners. For example, like in Okinawa, uh, where's the, uh, U.S. military base, and I believe like people there have, you know, like uh, more contacts with foreigners compared to, for example, the city that I was living in. So, do you think like the perspective, the perspectives and attitude towards foreigners of people like vary depending on like age, like, and those geographical areas? So. In the interest of time, uh, this is going to be a quick fire round. So, uh, yes, one more question. I'll just collect the question. Uh, not not really a question, but just my observation of Korean uh, culture that I think has a very good impact to education, to culture, like movie, drama, 
I think it's a very strong impact in Netflix that the Thai has very, I mean, addicted to the drama on politician, how they expose to the corruption, how this, uh, you know, educate. I think it's educating kind of drama that helping uh, people to learn a lot of the, I mean, the justice, how the judicial process has been exposed and corrupt. So I think this, this it can be a very good way also to get educating the people. There you go, Net, Netflix, <laughs> Korean drama, education value, right? So keep on watching. <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> okay. There. I know I'm just playing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Quick fire round. So Toru, two minutes. Kim, two minutes. And then Jocelyn, two minutes. And we'll wrap up. Okay. Toru. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think I got two questions. So first question is the local government. So um, I think the problem is that those unconsciously unappropriate uh, way of the treatment uh, is yeah depends on the ac yeah actually the the culture and the consciousness to the human rights is different in the urban to the local so I I think the the best basic way of the approach uh, is a is the legal education not only the central government but also the local government and I think the legal education in the local government is the very very limited because of the limit uh, limitation of the staff. And the limitation of the budget. So the the one way of the solution is a legal education. And the second question is, yeah, um, okay, the geographical tendency of the SNS testing. So, um, to be honest, the I don't the analyze the kind of the online the online SNS analysis. So actually, I'm not sure uh, in the, any connection between violent post and the geographical area and geographical boundaries. But um, in the general tendency that we have the three demonstration the, such as our uh, right wing right wing organization, the uh, straight demonstration uh, the against foreigners. But uh, those kind of demonstrations it take place in the Tokyo and the Osaka uh, because those two cities is the very concentrated we the we have the court the Korean town and the Korean division of the cities. So the, in those cities, the head speech is the very, very violent, violent sorry. So maybe, yeah, yeah, we have a ge geographical tendency. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Toru. Kim, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you for your question and comment. Uh, let me say that briefly, like a three division. First angle, so in terms of role and policy, uh, well, in Korea, we have, a, we try to, uh, accept the discrimination role. That means it's, it's not just about, you know, multiculturalism, it's not about the migrant workers. We also uh, try to include uh, like a uh, sexual uh, LGBT issue as well. So, but in terms of, of a level of law and um, the policy, so we have a kind of an active role to prevent discrimination, abuse, or something like that. The second law, uh, second term, in terms of a curriculum, school curriculum, you talk about the evidence of their like global cities, something like that. 2017 in Korea, we have a 17 local uh, uh, educational authority and the Ministry of Education. So both the local and central the government, we try to build up. Uh, global citizenship curriculum since 2017. So every curriculum should uh, uh, reflect the global citizenship issue. So global citizenship is not a vague, it's not an idealistic term that is more active. We don't say that just multiculturalism, multicultural education. We try to build up more democracy and solidarity. That is why we ASEAN community, Korean people try to work together or build up, uh, you know, their global mindset together. So that shows that, that sometimes is one of the evidence that we we supporting the migrant worker who undercut they uh, they their wage was discriminated because of the reason of their 
they are not from England, they are not from the America. Some local people, employers, they cut the wage for Thai people and Cambodian people, Myanmar people. So civil society keep monitoring that. The Ministry of Education gives the punishment for that, that company and the corporation, something like that. So role is acting. And again, the civil society is very actively reported that violation something that is important number three is you know so if you got have an idea of a global citizen maybe we can say not we cannot discriminate in front of other in front of people so in subway station some people taking you know you know holding their nose if somebody they met any migrant worker who has a skin color is different in korean society because still korea is a homogeneous society some people uh, called it like, oh, this is there are smelling something like that. So we have uh, some, you know, very violence issue in, in transportation in subway because the, some people discriminate Bangladesh migrant worker or Pakistan migrant worker. But at the same time, the ordinary people, what do you talk about that citizen, they said that, hey, you should dare, you shouldn't, you know, talk about like that way. So ordinary people react not just the policy, right? So policy level, school curriculum level, civil society level, that is a fair and democratic country. I'm not talking about the Korea is the, the perfect country. Korea is still going on. We should open the door, more inclusive society. Korea is very aging. Our low fertility of, in among OECD country, we are aging society. We should work together, live together with the ASEAN country. Otherwise, we might collapse. So we should not be very too proud of ourselves. I think you know the answer is you know global citizenship and work together. You know more civic movement throughout education, learning together. You know that is a very important thing. Thank you. Thank you, Kim, and to you, Jocelyn. Yes, thank you for the question. I think there's really a disparity, you know, in terms of the uh, pervasiveness of the anti-immigrant, anti-migrant sentiments. No, I can speak for uh, urban context. Has always been doing research in the Kanto region in Tokyo. No, that's the city. Um, in terms of age. Uh, not just in terms of age, but also geographical and also education. But education is more tied to um, to age. No, first in terms of age, I think this has been proven by uh, some studies. No, that there are a lot of younger people, younger Japanese, who have more open-minded, more um, liberal, you know, attitude towards migrants, especially if they have studied in universities that are cosmopolitan. No, if they have uh, studied together with foreign students, I think that reduces the prejudice and. I think younger people have, uh, you know, um, have a, a higher chance of uh, reduced, you know, prejudice. And uh, and I think from the perspective, I, th I think of, of contact theory that that also has been been confirmed. I think as far as Tokyo is concerned, where there are a lot of cosmopolitan universities and younger people, in fact, also are are very much um, although. Percentage-wise, it's still very low. Youth participation in social movements is very low in Japan, but uh, nevertheless, we see some young people getting involved in migrant causes. Um, the other one is geographically. Yeah, I've mentioned how Tokyo, maybe the situation in Tokyo is very uh, maybe different from um, rural areas. No, where there's a very sparse, limited number of migrant presence, no, mi migrant residents. And that translates into the lack of uh, familiarity and also maybe a discomfort, I think, if there are migrants that they encounter on a day-to-day -day basis in the rural areas compared to the cities. But I would say in the cities, this is more of a double-edged sword where maybe in the cities, people may be sensitive and become more aware of the presence of migrants because there are a lot of them in number but they, that also exposes them to the host of maybe some issues or problems that can be magnified i think as migrant you know problems if there are a lot of migrants in their midst so i think that th that sort of situation also happens in the cities uh, for example the idea that there's a very high incidence of divorce among migrants married to Japanese. And that is very much rampant in the cities compared to the rural areas where there's a higher success rate of intermarriage uh, 
uh, intermarriages. And then lastly, in terms of education, yeah, the, the more highly educated ones, and this has been proven by study as well, the less uh, prejudice they have towards migrants. And I think in relation to the to, to raising the point of, you know, the, the primacy of global citizenship education or multicultural education in Japan, which is very, very important. And uh, this has been, I think, indirectly being promoted in some multicultural cities such as Kawasaki, but still, you know, the, the promotion of multiculturalism in Japan is very uneven. So it's only in the cities where you see a lot of efforts going on as far as accepting more migrants and recognizing their efforts. But I, I guess in order for multicultural education to be successful in the long run, education should start from the grassroots and not just for the people who can afford to go to universities, no? those who can afford you know, uh, pri you know, privileged schools. Um, hopefully that, that kind of education, same goes for legal education. I think that should also be extended to the people on the lower you know, ranks of society in order for them to be sensitized as well. Thank you, Jocelyn, for that. I will uh, just take a couple more minutes to, 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 to wrap up the session. First of all, uh, to thank all the panelists. And I would like to, since uh, uh, Kim is here, I would like to present the certificate in person. Uh, uh, for the two of you, please check your email. You'll receive digital versions 